So we've talked in here before about how sometimes in order to really understand the message of Jesus, we have to get rid of beliefs that we've always been told are wrong. Right. Now I've seen a lot of people in my time that had Christian beliefs that were, for the lack of a better term, not right. And I've seen the damage those beliefs can cause. And they will forget not far from here, sitting in an apartment on Warren Street. An elderly woman had just lost her only child to cancer, and she was just sitting there sobbing. And she said, it's God's will. I've seen the agony of a middle-aged woman who was confined to bed for almost 25 years with a neurological disease. And I've seen the look on her face when someone stood over her bed and said, you know, God has the power to heal you, but you're right where he wants you to be. I've seen people who almost left Christianity altogether after experiences with churches with the preacher, fire breathing, hell fire and damnation, scared them to death type stuff. I've seen people who lived their entire lives trying to atone for mistakes they made when they were younger. And they were always wondering whether God would forgive them. I see Christianity used to justify killing people in righteous crusade. Now in the backs of a lot of these people's minds, they knew that at least some of these beliefs were right. I know that because they talked, someone talked to me about it, and I've seen them struggle with it. And it was a serious struggle. On one hand, there was a voice in the back of their minds that said, you know, I just know this is not right, it's not right. But whenever that voice would come up, they'd try to push it back in silence. But then there were times when they would hear that voice and they couldn't settle, maybe the voice is right, maybe that belief is not right. And then it would scare them to death. They even allowed themselves to consider it. And God forbid that anyone would ever know that they ever questioned one of those beliefs. I think your pressure plays a role in that. If everyone around you has certain beliefs, you feel you want to have those same beliefs too, just to fit in. After all, you're really not going to be a part of a group unless you share the beliefs and the attitudes and all of the group. You hear somebody proclaiming God is in control, you don't want to be the sore thumb and stand up and say, Wait a minute, I'm not sure the Bible really teaches that. And so the peer pressure factor is there. You go along to fit in. And that's what's known as the bandwagon effect. The bandwagon effect is the tendency of people to adopt certain behaviors and attitudes and styles and beliefs for no reason whatsoever other than that they are popular. We follow what others do in proportion to the number of people we see doing it. If only a few people do something, we don't feel pressure to do it, but if everybody's doing it, we'll do it too. And we do it to fit in. And a lot of times these behaviors and styles and attitudes and beliefs are accepted solely because of their popularity. Like I said, you don't want to be the sore thumb sticking out and disagreeing with something. And there's another factor in this too, I think. You go to a church and you hear a preacher preaching a certain belief and all, your tendency is to trust what you hear in church so you believe it, especially if it's some big name preacher or some big name Christian author. Did you want to stand up in a group of people and disagree with something Billy Graham said? I've done that before, it's pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> doesn't have to be somebody like Billy Graham, but maybe it's a neighbor that you think knows a lot more about the Bible than you do. And so you accept what they say. We tend to defer to people who we think know more than we do. But there's yet another factor in this too, and I think this is probably the most important one. And this is something called the illusory truth effect. And the illusory truth effect refers to the fact that people tend to accept something as true 
if they hear it repeated over and over again. And it's not necessary that you hear it repeated a hundred times a week. You can hear it repeated once a month. But if you hear something repeated on a regular basis, you tend to accept it as true. It doesn't have to be proven. No proof needs to be offered. It can even be a very implausible statement. But if it's repeated over and over again, people will tend to believe it. It also occurs in situations where people should know better. We would think that smart people, highly educated people, would be immune to it. But they're not. And not only are they not immune to it, actually the opposite is true. Studies have shown that its expertise in a subject actually increases someone's susceptibility to the illusory truth effect. You wouldn't think that would be true, but it is. People who are most familiar with the subject will be most likely to be fooled by something with the illusory truth effect. We tend to believe whatever we hear repeated over and over again. It doesn't have to be plausible. There doesn't have to be any proof offered. If we hear it repeatedly, we tend to believe it. Now, it's good to think about this because I wanted to emphasize that just because we hear something repeated over and over again does not mean it's true. The reverse is also true. Just because we have never heard of something before does not mean it is not true. And that's a good lead in to what I really want to talk about today. Sometimes there are very interesting things in the Bible. They are not clearly spelled out. They're there, but they're not obvious because they may be represented just by one short sentence or even a phrase. You're reading along and you see this little phrase, you think, well, what that means? You really don't know. You skip on over it and go on and forget about it. If you don't have any idea of the background of that, you'll miss a huge door opening that you never knew was there. And one of those things is something I'd like for us to talk about today. It's represented by just one little phrase in our New Testament reading. Of course, the passage came from Acts chapter 12, and it's Peter, the apostle Peter, is in prison, and Herod, the king, put him there. Herod did not like Christians, he was a Jew. And it says he killed a lot of Christians. And so he put Peter in prison. All this killing of Christians and in prison pleased the Jews. And so he was kept Peter there, and he had Peter under the guard of 16 soldiers. And he was going to bring him out before the people. We're not sure exactly what bring him out before the people was, but the surmise on that is that he was going to kill him. So there Peter was in prison, and it says that other Christians were praying for him. And one night shortly before Herod was going to bring him out or kill him or whatever, Peter was sleeping. He was bound for two chains set between two soldiers. And a bunch of other soldiers were guarding the door. An angel appears there, and light shined, chains fell off. The angel told Peter to get up and get dressed, and they got up and got dressed and went out, and magically went by past the guards, and went out, went out the gate of the city, which opened for them of its own accord. And then they came to the streets, and all of a sudden the angel was gone. And it says that Peter at that point realized that God had sent this angel to deliver him from Herod and the Jews. And so he went to the home of a woman named Mary where many Christians were gathered and knocked on the door. It says that a girl named Rhoda went to answer the door. She heard it was Peter and she got so excited that she just ran back and told the people without letting them in. She ran back and told the people that Peter was at the door and they said, oh, you're crazy. And she insisted. And so they said, it is his angel. So Peter kept knocking on the door. They 
finally opened the door and laid me in. Then he went in there and told him what had happened, and then he left and went somewhere else. Now, the interesting thing I wanted to talk about was that little phrase they thought it is his angel. So when Rhoda recognized Peter's voice, she went back and told the people Peter was at the door. They didn't believe her. They thought he was in prison. She insisted he's there, so they said, it is his angel. So what did they mean by that? If you were reading along through there, that was there, what would you think? I mean, would you stop and ponder that or try to find out what it means? Or would you just go on to the next verse and keep going? So what does it mean? Obviously, it means something. So I want to stop and talk about something here. It's something that we've talked about in here before, but I think you can't emphasize it too much. The people in the Bible came from 2,000 years ago, a completely opposite end of the world than we were from. 2,000 years ago, very different time and place. It's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that their beliefs were exactly like ours. It's easy to fall into that trap and think that the beliefs of that first generation of Christians were exactly like ours. But they were not. If they were, we'd immediately know what it meant when it said they thought it was his angel standing at the door. So since we don't know that, we know that there is at least some difference in belief going on here. <clears throat> There's obviously something in the background that it is his angel. So what is it? In some forms of Judaism, at the time the New Testament was written and before, there was a belief that every person on earth has what's called a heavenly double or a heavenly counterpart in heaven. And so the belief was that every person on earth is mirrored, duplicated by another person just like them in heaven. And so according to this belief, there is another you just like you existing in heaven right now. Now keep in mind that these people in Acts were Christians. They were Christians. And think about what that means. From that we know that at least some of those ancient Christians held the belief that each person on earth is mirrored by a person just like them in heaven. Where does that belief come from? We do not know. But we see it expressed in the New Testament, we also see it expressed in Jewish writings called sued epigrapha. And that's a technical term for a certain kind of writing that appeared in Judaism for about 500 years after the Old Testament period up to a period after the time of Jesus. They are usually prophetic writings, which means they are used to convey a message about the future Although sometimes they contain a message about the past, the word pseudepigrapha refers to the fact that these writings bear the titles of major Old Testament figures. Titles like Moses, Ezekiel, Joseph, Joshua. And so the idea is that people were trying to pass them off as being written by Moses, but nobody knows. They might have the title of the pseudepigrapha of Joseph or of Ezekiel or something. They could have put it there to pass it off as being written by one of those people. They could have just put it there to just say, well, these ideas originated with Joseph and came down. They could have put it there to give it authority, or they could have just put it there for some other reason that we have no idea what the reason was. And so it's an open question. People have different opinions as to why they titled them like that. In reality, no one knows. There is a writing called the Pseudepigrapha of Joseph. This is not referring to the New Testament Joseph. It's the Old Testament Joseph. The 
There's no way to know why somebody tried it that. You can guess about it, but keep in mind that whatever you come up with is going to be a guess. A, a number of these writings have survived. And while they are not treated as scripture, they do give us an idea of the beliefs within Judaism during the time of Jesus. And most importantly, they give us an idea of at least what some people were thinking back then. What kinds of beliefs some people had. Lest we think that the ideas contained in those writings are out there and something we don't need to pay attention to. It's interesting to note that at least two New Testament books, the books of Jude and James, quote directly from at least three of these ancient Jewish pseudepigrapha. So we have to conclude that at least two of the New Testament authors thought highly enough of some of those words that they quoted them in their own scripture. And so this tells us that within the Christian faith in the early years, these writings were seen as important enough to be included in their writing. In addition, several early Christian writings after the New Testament period have survived that reference this idea of the heavenly double. And so the belief was that every person on earth is mirrored by a spiritual being everywhere like them in heaven right now. And this person was seen as your guardian angel. Now we've talked in here before about the concept of a guardian angel and that can be supported by a number of New Testament passages. This is just a variation on the idea of the guardian angel. Now the idea was that you can interact with your heavenly double. And some of those Jewish pseudepigrapha, that's what they're about. Somebody is interacting with either their heavenly double or the belief was that you could interact with somebody else's heavenly double. Okay. And this would be consciously or unconsciously. Now sometimes these heavenly doubles are pictured as feeding the person on earth. In one account, the heavenly double feeds the person on earth with some kind of thing referred to as honeycomb. And its contents were described as dew from heaven. In another account, the heavenly food is described as the spirit of life. So I want to think about what this means. The idea that every person is doubled and mirrored by another person just like them existing in heaven. Every person. You know, there is a passage in Paul's writing when he says that we are already seated in heaven with Christ. He says that. There, are, there is that passage in there. We already have eternal life. We do not know a lot about this belief in the heavenly double. We don't know a lot of the particulars about Judaism during the time of Jesus. The Judaism that we know about is Judaism that started about a thousand years ago. We really don't know what Judaism was like during the time of Jesus. We don't even know exactly what Christianity was like during the time of Jesus except what we find in the New Testament. The Christianity that we're most familiar with was not even developed until 300 years after Jesus. And for a lot of people, the Christianity that they know about was not developed for like 1,600 years after Jesus. So we don't know a lot of the particulars about this belief in the heavenly double that's been lost to history. But we know it was there. And we know it was there enough to be referenced in the New Testament several times. Now granted, you've got to know about it to see it. You've got to have a little background to know that that's what they're talking about and know that's what it references. But it is that. It is that. I find it fascinating. 
and don't really know what to do with that belief. The idea that there is another person in heaven right now who mirrors you and who some way helps sustain you. Who some way is your guardian. Who sometimes consciously or unconsciously can interact with you and give you advice. How does it work? I don't know. But it's fascinating to consider. I've said this before, and I hope this is one of the main things you take from your time here at the Chapel of Christ. I am absolutely convinced that when we get to heaven, we'll find out just how different things actually were than what we thought they were.